oh, I love Grail and I brag about it to everyone. When they first came from the islands, this was the place to stay. It was the cheapest place, the cheapest area to live. So quite a lot of my relations at that time lived in Grayland in Ponsonby. It was cheap. <laughs> and my parents bought their house there for $7,000 in the um, early 80s. So I can't even imagine how cheap the rents would have been. It's sort of alternative, arty. It was just a real mixture. Very, very, we come from London, which is very cosmopolitan, and this sort of had a, a cosmopolitan feel, and it just seemed fairly laid back. I think that was the, the word I'd use to describe it. I guess it was very working class and lots of artists, and um, uh, it was kind of cool in, in some senses and kind of really shit in others, like there's lots of madness and chaos. But you know, also like, I think within that there's sort of a freedom and to do, you know, like we were less allowed to do whatever we wanted and stay out all night and run around and that kind of stuff was cool, you know. My memories of growing up in Grayland were very carefree and a lot of people around because there were a lot of new Pacific Islanders in the area then so there was a whole generation of us that grew up together you know, in the neighbourhood so I remember it was just carefree and fun and a lot of people. Well I think like, nowadays um, obviously it's a much wealthier suburb. I remember the first time that someone on the, ha on the street painted their house and they're like, they were like a young couple that moved there and then, so that would have been in like the late 80s and they had like a car and like a fluffy dog and stuff and everyone was like, what the f***? I remember throwing, we used to throw rocks at them and yell at them and all this shit. And they probably were like lower middle class, they, probably, they were probably actually wealthy but comparatively, you know? I mean a lot of it's to do with the price of housing and, and how, I mean, Grayland was always affordable, you know, when we came it was affordable, uh, reasonably. Um, and it's just in recent years, price of houses has gone ballistic and like everywhere else it's difficult for people to get somewhere to live. Well in the 80s I was 20 so and I went and lived in Sydney for nine years and when I came back Glenn had changed again so through the 80s it had changed to upmarket um, white collar people, you know, white collar workers. And me and my friends, we found a house um, that stayed within our friendship circle for about 10 years and it was real cheap. It was falling to pieces, like had holes in the walls and stuff um, on Tuakina Street. And so we just kept that and then the landlord eventually was like, hey, I can make shitloads of money off this and kicked us out and painted and fixed it and stuff. Um, so that would have been 2010. So that, and then I came back, I went overseas and I came back in 2013. And I was just crazy, man. Like someone was like, "Yeah, I got a room. It's three hundred dollars a week." And I was like, "Get the f out of here, man!" Like, it's just that's like New York rents. And I'm not gonna pay New York rents and live in f Auckland, like. <laughs> hey. But they speak about the kids playing in the street, riding the bikes around everywhere. So I suppose that kind of community. Um, thing gets eroded because the, the people with the cash that move in, they don't seem to really want to be part of the community, you know, it's more like, okay, now I'm in grey land, I'm going to put up my big fence with a security pad. And there is pressure now with all these house prices, people to sell and make, make money and new developments go up, so maybe it's really going to change in the next few years. I know a lot of people, families that I grew up with have all left, even up to the last couple of years, have sold up and moved out just because of the cost of living in the city. You know, like everyone I know like now like pretty much lives overseas. Um, so like the whole community's just gone. Um, and so losing something like that, I think, yeah, it definitely affects you and it's something that I write about a lot because you try and make sense of it. And I think it's a loss that is like, is not really taken that seriously. It's people like, oh, whatever, man, just go move to Mount Albert. And, which is cool, yeah, you know, like there's nothing wrong with that, but I feel like, I don't know, I guess it's like, and it, I mean, traumatized is too strong a word, but it definitely. It's
talks with people and a lot of my friends are like, um, I see it in the, you know, like in the way they live, you know, they drink a lot and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's because it's like, you go to this place and it feels like home, right? And you're like, oh man, I know this and you've got all these memories, but you're not welcome there, you know what I mean? You can't afford to live there. It's not just shops and things on the main street. There's also kind of slightly um, a, a next level down which is changing, which you don't always see. It's things like the halfway houses closing for people that are you know, mild psychological illnesses or people that have come out of prison. Um, there's always been quite a few of those around. Pensioner houses, um, the Bethany Centre for unmarried pregnant girls to get them on the right track. And a lot of those things have closed now and been bulldozed and um, architectural mansions built up with you know swimming pools and all the rest of that which is fine to build that but why knock down something that's been there for 100 years providing care to the vulnerable people to do it you know surely you can find somewhere else to knock down you know you know the future um what's going to happen with these uh major developments is will will Grayland still stay that same that same mix or is it going to just encourage the developers to come in and and buy people out and so it becomes out of reach uh i just i guess you know obviously i'm going to be resentful because it's like fuck, i still like to live there man i still like to be able to walk into town and i still like to have all my friends around me and where i live it's all just families and shit you know so like there's not that thing and Greyland now is just like, I don't know, it's like a f***ing, it's like a f***ing strip mall for rich people, you know, like they've got culture, you know. More money, more boring, less tolerance. I mean, there's not a lot of good stuff about it really, is there? <laughs> you know, you've got a couple of cafes and you can buy a bottle of champagne. But, um... You know, like places are, places are only places because of the people in them. And so all these like rich people have like, and, and, and it's not their fault, you know what I mean? Because I know people that have moved there and who are actual gentrifiers and they're nice people, you know, like, um, but it's like, they go there because they want this culture, but by being there, they're forcing the people out. I've come to the realization that change is inevitable. So, yes, it's, it's natural to go, oh, it's a shame and um, how it used to be and all the rest of it, but what, is, is there some kind of solution to soften the blow? It is, it's a curious place, Graylin, because it's sort of like a crossroads, you know, the way Williamson Road comes up here. So it's very much a cut through to the motorway. So it's, a, it's slightly transient and um, maybe that's stopped it being like Ponsonby Road and getting really up fight. Yeah, I couldn't imagine myself living anywhere else. So, yeah, I just love everything about Graylin. Yeah. You know, this is a loose, uh, uh, a nice, easygoing area, and there is still that mix, that still cosmopolitan mix that makes you feel comfortable, I think. I mean, I'd like to think everywhere in New Zealand's like that. Maybe it is. <laughs> Be nice, wouldn't it? That time.